us in the theater, everyone joining us online, the Apollo Theater, WNYC, and the March on Washington Film Festival proudly present MLK, Blueprint for the Culture. I'm Terrence McKnight. I'm the classical music host on WNYC's sister station, WQXR. And today I'm your master of ceremonies. Please join me in the world here at the world famous Apollo Theater, Camilla Forbes. today on this Sunday. Hello. Hi. Well, we are so pleased to welcome everyone here this afternoon because this is an afternoon of celebration because also we're in person. For the last two years, we've done this event virtually. So can we please recognize what that means and what we've had to overcome to get here? Yeah. You know, we're pleased to welcome you this also this afternoon because today is a day of celebration and of reflection and of joyfulness as we remember Dr. King. Uh, we've missed you all. We've missed you all in these seats. <laughs> and Brenda Williams Butts and WNYC committed to presenting this program 17 years ago. And this is a partnership that the Apollo has been a part of for the last 10 years and has been a major staple of our own community programming. Partnering on this event with WNYC in collaboration with the March on Washington Film Festival is always truly a highlight of the year. Now today we meditate on how the civil rights movement has been the blueprint not only for the ongoing struggle for social justice in the United States, but also all over the world. Now as I listened to Dr. King's speeches, you know, I was struck once again by how we are using the same exact language in 2023 that King, that Young, that Abernathy and others were using in 1957. Now that was 66 years ago. Now on one hand, I am angered and outraged and saddened by this reality. But on the other hand, I'm convicted to deepen my own resolve even further and recommit myself and this institution to this work of social justice and of equality. Now our season theme of this year has been the next movement. Y'all might have seen it all throughout the theater and on the slide. And the next movement has been a recognition of movement work in the historical sense as well as the movements of the performers, of the writers, and of the thought leaders that we present right here on the stage. Now they continue to tell the stories of struggle, of triumph, and of joy through music, through dance, through film, through literature, and through visual interpretation. But what we learn from these brilliant creatives and intellectuals night after night is that we can each change the world by changing the parts that we occupy. It's all about how we show up in it. Because Dr. King showed up for us over and over and over again. He showed up in Montgomery, where a movement was born. In Birmingham, where he sent us a letter. In Detroit, where I have a dream originated. And in Chicago, where he tried but failed in Selma, where a march led to voting rights, and in Harlem, where it were, were it not for Harlem Hospital, he would have died, and in Memphis, where the dreamer was taken. So I encourage you all today to show up. The dream, like the blueprint, is not ours alone. It is for the future generations to finally win the fight for justice and equality. Now with that, With that being said, it is my deepest honor and pleasure to welcome WNYC's new president and CEO, LaFontaine Oliver. Thank you, Camila. And good afternoon, everyone. 
I want to first take a moment to express my gratitude to all who have shared their brilliance, their energy, and their creativity to make this celebration possible. I want to thank our partners at the March on Washington Film Festival and the uh, incredible Apollo Theater, led by visionary president and CEO Janelle Proko. Former trustee and also a longtime friend of WNYC. And of course, I want to thank New York Public Radio's Board of Trustees and each of you for joining us here today. Now, some of you may know that uh, today is uh, officially my seventh day uh, on the job as president and CEO of WNYC and New York Public Radio. I could not be more happy. But I imagine um, there's even few of you who know that I grew up a theater kid um, and had the opportunity to perform on stages large and small, including uh, with an original Broadway cast. But there is no stage bigger than the historic Apollo Theater stage. And so for me, standing here today before you, for today's program, um, it's nothing short of a dream come true for me. Best week ever, <laughs> first week on the job. So thank you all. As I was thinking about today's event, I was struck by the title, Blueprint for the Culture, and how rich that particular phrasing is. A blueprint is a sketch a plan, a roadmap for something one wants to build. It is in itself an articulation of a dream, a desire for the way we want something to look, and a proposal for what we want to go on in that place. A blueprint is also, it's a collective document. It's something that an architect makes in conversation with the people who are going to inhabit whatever is being built, and everyone else who understands the rules, the rituals, geography, the lay of the land, if you will, of where it is going to stand. A blueprint is also by nature unfinished, subject to revision as obstacles and opportunities emerge and plans change. Sound familiar? The teachings of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr are in fact a blueprint, an endearing portrait of where we could go, where we should go as a society. They've been that way for me my entire life and for my entire career, and they remain so for the artists, thinkers, and activists that we're going to hear from today. So if I'm carrying this metaphor along, it is our responsibility in the media to be the drafting table on which blueprints can be built and the open forum where neighbors, experts, community leaders can come together and weigh in on the sketches, the plans, and those inevitable revisions. I'm also excited to be joining the team of New York Public Radio because this is our mission and mandate operating as the truly free and independent press that Dr. King knew was essential for a thriving democracy, and also enriching not only the head, but the heart and the spirit through rich cultural and music programming. Today, we have with us so many people who do the work of imagining new futures and working hard to build them, including two visionary thinkers who power New York Public Radio. Kai Wright, host of WNYC's weekly live call-in show, Notes from America, every Sunday. Yes, give it up. And Terrence McKnight, host of our classical music station, WQXR, who is also about to release a new podcast, Every Voice with Terrence McKnight, focusing on the stories of marginalized figures in classical music. You all be on the lookout for that. So thank you so much for joining us today. I'm delighted to welcome all of the WNYC and WQXR fans in the house. 
And to those of you who have not yet engaged with us on air, online, on your mobile devices, I encourage you to check us out. The types of conversations and the performances that you're gonna be hearing today are exactly the ones that we are trying to uplift every day on our airwaves. So now I have the pleasure to hand things off to someone who in many ways, uh, whose footsteps I actually stand in, as she once hosted a radio program on a station that I later managed that every single day lived out the meaning of its call letters, WEAA, We Educate African Americans. Join me in welcoming Isasora Bay, Artistic Director of the March on Washington Film Festival. Giving praise to the source of all life and honor to the seven directions, north, south, east, west, above, below, and within and to the cycle of life of African ancestored peoples, those who've gone on before, those living and those yet to be born. Because they were, we are. Because we are, they will be. I rejoiced when I heard them say, let us go into the Apollo Theater, <laughs> this cathedral of culture. The March on Washington Film Festival is honored to contribute to this event. In our theme today, as you've already heard, blueprint, the word is used, and it also refers to legacy, the evidence of activism passed down from those directly involved during that period from the death of Emmett Till in 1955 to the death of Dr. King in 1968. Many films document the movement and movement makers. A recent one is Lowndes County and the Road to Black Power, which outlines a couple of points important in a blueprint. Number one, a movement is self-organizing. At its best, it is a grassroots effort so that the people most at risk have their say. The Lowndes County, Alabama voter registration drive was already galvanized by the people of Lowndes before the SCLC or SNCC came to town. Number two, that this movement is a continuum. Priorities and strategies shift over time. For example, did you know that the drawing of the Black Panther was first used in Lowndes County. It helped voters differentiate the candidates of the Lowndes Freedom Party from the all-white segregationists whose symbol was a drawing of a white rooster with the words white supremacy on the top for the right on the bottom. After freedom candidates won some offices, the Panther symbol receded in Lowndes but rose in Oakland with the Black Panther Party. Three, leaders in the SCLC, SNCC, and the Black Power Movement were divided over whether this is a moral fight or something more radical. Dr. King called his path militant resistance. He understood that we are all caught in a system of injustice and inequality. The six principles of nonviolence say that we must resist violence to the spirit as well as the body. That we recognize that evildoers are also victims. That all life is interrelated. Therefore, nonviolence seeks to defeat injustice, not people. That is inner work, and it's no easy task. It takes compassion, courage, and strength. Finally, one of my favorite teachings says, love has three powers. The power to create, which means to make something new. The power to save, which is to redeem and restore. And the power to destroy, which means to dismantle and transform. But in each instance, love wins. Love 
wins. Let us keep that in whatever blueprint we create as we move forward. Thank you. And now, your host for MLK Blueprint for the Culture, Harlemite, host and managing editor of Notes from America, the WNYC Live Sunday night call-in show and podcast, Kai Wright. Hello, Apollo. So first and foremost, I need to do this. So y'all, please do not boo me off this stage. Uh, okay, so a little bit of housekeeping. What you're about to witness is a live taping of our program, Notes from America. Uh, we are on every Sunday night at 6 o'clock. This is Sunday. It is 3 o'clock. So in a couple of hours, this is going to be on the radio around the country. Uh, and um, so there's some people in, in, around back who are having a stressful afternoon. <laughs> we are all going to have fun. And I'm going to need a couple of things from you in order for that to happen. So first off, because it's live, I'm going to be every now and then taking a break and talking to all the people that are listening on the radio so that uh, you know their stations can tell them who's sponsoring it and what the weather is and stuff like that. Just ride along with me as I do that. Uh, when I come back from those breaks, and a couple of times I'm gonna have to say, hey, we are live from the stage at the Apollo Theater. And when I say that, you are going to do what? <laughs> well done, that is what we want. And in general, this is the Apollo Theater, so don't sit quiet if something, don't boo me, but if your spirit is moved to make a joyful noise, make that noise. Um, so what else do I have to tell you? Uh, and uh, also, because it's going to be on the radio in a couple hours, please, if you have not silenced your phone yet, now is the time to do that. You don't want to be on the radio in Cleveland with your special ringtone. You don't want that. Uh, and while you're out, while you've got your phones out doing that, you might as well follow us on Instagram and Twitter. It's Notes with Kai is, is our handle. You should uh, use our hashtag if you tweet, if you, if you Instagram about tonight um, or today. Uh, and, um, and that'll be great. What else? Okay, last thing, last thing. Bef when, when I finish this first hour, I'm going to say bye. I'm going to be like, that's it. It's been great. That is not a signal for you to leave. There's... <laughs> There's a whole nother hour that is wonderful of, Terrence's, that, of, of performances that Terrence has curated for us. So you should stay for that. I can't wait for it. Uh, but I'll be telling the people on the radio that they can go about their business. All right? We ready? OK, well, let's get started. When you hear the term young, gifted, and black, what does it make you think of? Well, I'm a 60s baby. <laughs> so I grew up hearing that. That's where it's at. <laughs> young, gifted, and black. That's what we are. We're young, we're gifted, we're black. It's a song by Nina Simone. I love the song. And it's a, uh, it's a testament to our contributions in society. You know, not only the beauty of our skin, but uh, of our talents and the things that we bring to this country. A lot of youth these days, they really have their good heads on their shoulders. I'm so proud to see how many young people are out here making things happen for themselves. So I definitely have heard that. Young, gifted, and black, yes. yes. <laughs> Welcome to the show. I'm Kai Wright, recording live from the stage of the Apollo Theater in Harlem, New York. Hello, Apollo! All right, all right, we got a live crowd. This is a special broadcast of Notes from America to celebrate Martin Luther King Jr. Day, produced in partnership between WNYC, the Apollo Theater, and the March on Washington, and broadcast to public radio stations all over the country. Our inspiration tonight is the song Young, Gifted, and Black. And so to set up the hour, I am joined by one of our show's favorite scholars, 
Princeton University professor of American, excuse me, Princeton University professor of African American studies, Dr. Amani Perry. Amani, welcome back. Thank you. So Amani's most recent book is South to America, A Journey Below the Mason-Dixon Line to Understand the Soul of a Nation. And Amani, when you were last on the show, I did accurately predict that you were going to win the National Book Award for that incredible work. Oh, so wow. <laughs> congratulations <laughs> is due. Thank you. I feel like it's the closest I'm going to get to a National Book Award <laughs> is to like tell Amani she was going to win. So I'm going to just take that shine. Uh, and we keep inviting you here to talk about everything but the book. Um, but we love right. your work on playwright Lorraine Hansberry. Um, and that's important because our text is Young, Gifted, and Black. Nina Simone first recorded the song in 1970. It's really one of the great cultural artifacts of the civil rights movement. It's been covered by Aretha Franklin, by Donny Hathaway, by Common. Everybody's got a favorite version. But it has a backstory yes. that begins with Lorraine Hansberry, so help us out. Okay, so I just want to say really quickly, it is such an honor and delight to be here in one of, in, in, at the Historic Apollo and also with you. Um, so. Lorraine Hansberry was judging a, a writing competition for the United Negro College Fund in 1964. And she delivered a speech. And in the speech she said, it's a marvelous thing to be young and gifted, but doubly so to be young, gifted, and black. Mm. And it was consistent with her vision of understanding that, um, black, that black experience had actually given birth to an extraordinary tradition, not one of deficiency, but one of incredible resilience and brilliance. So they were gifted both in terms of their ability, but had been gifted with, an, with a beautiful legacy, right? And so when, and Nina Simone is one of her best friends, um, and after her passing, writes this song that in many ways is a dedication to her friend Hansberry and Hansberry's vision. What does it mean to you when you hear that song? Like when, when you hear it, and particularly in the context of that moment, like yeah. what are you hearing? Oh gosh, I mean I, so I hear it, I, and I was born in 1972, so I hear it in the 70s, mm -hmm. right? In a sense, this moment of, um, of striving, of a kind of defiant, bold blackness, right? The, the, that generation, that earlier generation gave to us. So I hear the song as actually this song of a sort of keep on pushing. Right, um, and actually being inheritors of something. Yeah, yeah. something that beautiful. generation, you, when you make reference to it, I think we forget that the movement, it was young. The civil yeah. rights movement. Oh, they what, were young people. It was yeah. a young thing, right? Yes. Tell us about the right? I mean, if you think about, you know, so, so King is, you know, emerges, Dr. King emerges as a figure. He's in his 30s, right? And yeah. many, and Hansberry is as well. And she's involved from a distance because she's, she's ill, but she's organizing and raising funds for the movement. These are, many of them are college students, right? And so they are actually taking the reins of envisioning a future, use the language of, of blueprint um, earlier today, but taking the reins of a vision of black liberation are people who are between 18 and 22, by and large. Yeah. 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 Uh, for me, one of uh, your most affecting works is your 2019 book, Breathe, A uh, Letter to My Sons. Thank you. I is it fair to say the book is, uh, I will, uh, let me put words in your mouth and let you react to them. Uh, for me, uh, okay. it's kind of an instructional to them on how to live in the world as young, gifted, and black boys uh, who are too often seen as something entirely different than that. Absolutely. I mean, I, I, I wanted, and it's for them, and it's, it's also for members of their generation broadly, and also for witnesses to see them differently, right? And the idea is that they um, are constrained in so many ways, but I want them to fly. Mm -hmm. And I want them to have, I want them not only to fly, but to soar. And I want them to soar knowing that they have a tradition to draw on. Um, and I want them to soar knowing that they are deeply loved mm -hmm. and that it is a gift to have them in the world. You know, so often people describe um, black children, in particular black boys, as a problem. And I think that instead, we ought to understand how much of a bounty it is to have them in our lives, right? And how gorgeous and beautiful and special they are. So, you know, that's the message. Yeah. There's a, a, a section in the book where you're talking about, like, oh, they're going to tell you you go to the bathroom wrong. Yes. You're gonna, it, 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 it's unbelievable, the, th the messages, mm -hmm. right? You're, every, every bit of their lives are often subject to criticism and it you know and there's a lot of research on it academic scholarly research but we know it intuitively 
right? The ways in which you're always picked at. And so you actually, it's not enough to say, don't listen to that. You actually have to, you ha we have to feed our young people with alternative messages, right? The, the re they need to have the resources, the armor to actually enter a world that is constantly diminishing them. Yeah. How did, uh, yes, clap for yeah. that. <laughs> How did, how did your sons react to, to this message from in the book? So it's interesting, right? Because you write a book, and it's an artifact. It's this thing that's out in the world. And yeah. then they're living with you day to day, right? <laughs> so they don't actually care that much about the book. Um, because, it, you know, in many, and I was writing letters to them before I had, you know, before the idea of the book even came to be. So these are messages that are very familiar in a kind of, you know, this is, this is the mother they have, right? Um, who's saying this stuff all the time. Um, I think it's a little, so it's a little strange. It's also weird because they were younger when the book yeah, was written, yeah. right? And so now they're like, you know, they're 16 and 19. You know, they're like, <laughs> well, they're fully formed and people are surprised when they meet them. Like, yeah, that was a moment in time. But you know, they're They're so gonna be asked to study you in school. My younger son has had that experience already. <laughs> Uh, it's weird, uh, but but you know they're so generous with me. They're so loving. They're so supportive of my work, and so um, I, I I am so grateful for them. Yeah, so grateful. Uh, just to bring us back to the song for a minute before, I, I, just to tease, we're going to hear it. Um, so Nina Simone, when she wrote it, was in a period of bringing the music to the bring, bringing the music to be, being the move, movement into her yes. music, right? Um, and King's Murder had like deeply impacted her. Deeply impacted her, and we have, and and you know, it was the succession of of deaths, right? So Lorraine, her dear friend, um, and then a couple of weeks later, Malcolm X, right? And then so there's this succession of deaths. She's she has uh, emotional and psychological wounds, and so and I would just say really quickly. Hansberry is really the person who, who pushed her to be politically engaged. Mm. She said, you know, Nina, you also, have to. Also, as you told us before, Hansberry pushed Baldwin yes, to she be pushed, more Oh, yeah, she pushed well. Baldwin to the left, and she pushed Nina Simone, saying, your, your work actually needs to be responsive to this political moment. Wow. Um, and so, you know, part of what I take the song to be doing is a kind of, she's gathering the resources for this stage of the fight with so many people who have departed. Right, as, as Nina Simone said, the king of love is dead. Right, what do we do now? Right, and she says we, we actually sit in the beauty of being young, gifted, and black, right? Before we wrap and hear the song, just speak a bit about the, the intersection of culture. So Nina Simone's cultural act, artifact is one, yes. right? But you've written a lot about a number of, you know, studying literature and art, yes. about the intersection of, the, of, of black performers like those that would be on this stage. Yeah. Um, and the movement in that time. Oh yeah, there's, I mean, the, there's a, an extraordinary literary movement that's coming in the, almost immediately after, you know, Toni Morrison publishes her first novel in 1970. There's a succession of all of these black women writers. There's a music, there's dance, there's poetry, there's the stage play of Young, Gifted, and Black, which is based upon, uh, it's a posthumous uh, story of, of Hansberry's life that is performed across the country. One of the, the stories that I tell in, in talking about Hansberry is that my, my, my family's high school, the high school most of our family went to in Birmingham, Alabama, performed Young, Gifted, and Black in the 70s, right? So there's, there's a way in which um, our extraordinary tradition of performance and creativity is all um, kind of, uh, the energy of that goes into the idea of black liberation. Yeah. We're gonna talk in more detail with Amadi Perry later in the show, but as I hinted at, let's actually hear this remarkable song. We are lucky to have with us an incredible group of performers, all from the Washington DC, Maryland, and Virginia area. They're called The Collective, and they're led by Emmy-nominated producer Jonathan Ball of Dream Launchers. They're gonna perform their own arrangement of Young, Gifted, and Black, and then we'll take a break, and when we return, we'll meet one of the young, gifted, and black people inspiring today's racial justice movements. So stick around. Here's The Collective.
Well, I uh, had a great concern for and uh, commitment to the whole uh, problem of racial injustice, of solving the problem, I should say. Uh, I became very concerned about it in my early childhood and in my teenage days, this problem became a greater concern. And uh, I said from the beginning that in some way, I wanted to be a part of solving this problem. Welcome back. I'm Kai Wright, and that was, of course, Martin Luther King Jr. He was being interviewed in 1961 about his decision to join the ministry and the Montgomery bus boycott, which he helped to lead at just 25 years old. This is a special MLK Day weekend broadcast of Notes from America. We are recording live from the stage at the world-famous Apollo Theater in Harlem, New York. Hello, Apollo. And I am joined now by Chelsea Miller, who, much like Dr. King, is a young person who has decided they need to make a difference in the movement for racial justice. Chelsea is co-founder of Freedom March NYC, which is a youth-led civil rights organization that emerged from the 2020 uprisings in response to George Floyd's murder. In cities all over the world, people filled the streets in solidarity for much of that historic summer. And while the outpouring was in some ways spontaneous, it also grew out of organizing and work and planning from people like Chelsea, many of them quite young. Chelsea was a recent college graduate at the time. She helped coordinate the movement here in New York, and that was neither her first nor her last experience organizing and advocating for social justice. She has been particularly interested in the lives of, and experiences of young women of color. And thank you so much for joining the show. And thank you for having me. Uh, can we start with the song we just heard? What, what, what's it mean to you to be young, gifted, and black? When, when you hear that song, how, does, how, how do you hear that? Every time I hear it, it moves me. Every time I hear it, it makes me sad mm. because to know the life of Nina Simone and also to know that that song within and of itself is an act of resilience. And what is it about being young, gifted, and black that is also a cry for liberation? And that's because of a narrative that has told us that we are none of those things. And so how do we defy? How do we show up? And also, how do we reimagine joy? And I think that's something that consistently young people are striving to do. I gather that how you grew up shaped a lot about your worldview. You're a first generation Jamaican American, and that's important to your identity, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> How so? Tell, us, t yeah. tell me about that. So for me, my parents came to New York in the 90s, and so I grew up watching my mom struggle, and that played such a large role in how I understood and perceived the world, and also the way that she fought, right? The way that she fought against systems, the way she fought against people to give us a better education, to instill within us all of the truths about ourselves and our history and our power that oftentimes we don't see reflected in the world. And so it was because of my mom that I started having an interest and kind of awakened within me a desire to create change. She was a social worker. Um, she came to New York and a lot of what she did was in the space of helping young girls of color. When I was about 11 years old, she turned our two family home into a group home for young girls. And so I grew up with foster sisters and seeing that. And a lot of, I mean, what was, the, can I ask you, I mean, what was that like to suddenly share your mom in your home with all these new people? My mom's Jamaican, so. <laughs> <laughs> Distract her for me. Yeah, that's what it was like, uh, because now you have all of us in the house, and you know, she has so much love to give, and I'm one of six, so I always grew up with a big family, and so, Having foster sisters was just an addition to all of the love, all of the energy, and it, and it was a lot of you know feminine energy as well. And so um, it shaped me in, in so many ways, and, I, and I'm grateful for that because I never take for granted my story, but also I know the importance of how all of our stories are connected and the responsibility to do better for the world. Mm. Yes. 
you, you grew quite close to some of the girls, some of the foster sisters you had. What did you learn about yourself from them? I learned patience. <laughs> I learned patience because the thing is you have to remember that for a lot of people, love is something that we have to learn. It's not something that's innate, right? There's certain levels of attachment styles. There's certain levels of how you understand and experience the world. And so for a lot of my foster sisters who are coming into our home, that was the first time that they were experiencing having a parental figure, experiencing having a structured family unit. And for a lot of times, that scares you because you're afraid that it might be taken away or it's abnormal, this idea of rules and you know, I have to be home by eight o'clock and all of these things. And so it wasn't this idealized version of, you know, kind of like full house. <laughs> that wasn't <laughs> it. It was a constant push and pull of redefining and reimagining consistently love, right? And like, what is that rooted in? And that was how I reimagined, just thought through sisterhood and all of the things that ultimately would go into defining how I showed up in the world and the mm. things that I would create as a result of that. Mm, that's powerful. Take me to May of 2020. Um, you were just out of college, uh, if I'm right. Uh, you already had lots of experience with social justice work. The city was totally shut down. Um, the pandemic, if we recall, had, had really was just getting underway and news breaks of George Floyd's murder. What were you seeing at the time that made you as an individual want to act? When you know your history, there is something extremely dangerous about that because you know what's gonna happen before it does. And so as I was watching the way in which everything was playing out on our phones and our TVs, I said, this is going to be a narrative that says that we were complicit and we were silent. And the reason was because so many of us could not go outside. And I made that decision that I was going to go regardless. I was going to go in spite of the fact that we were in the midst of a pandemic. I was going to go in spite of the fact that there wasn't much structure taking place. And in spite of the fact of what the TV was saying, there's looting, there's rioting, there are hoodlums, there are thugs. We are none of those things. We have a right to exercise our First Amendment right. We have a right to hold this country to account because it has never been held to account. We have a responsibility to stand on the right side of history every single time. And so we went outside, and the first night that I went out, it was mayhem, right? Because there were agitators in the crowd, and if you have studied the civil rights movement, you know that this is normal. There were folks that were trying to get um, protesters to break into one of the buildings in downtown. The issue was that, with that was the fact that there were a lot of young people in the crowd. Now, if there was going to be destruction of property, there were dozens of police vans. It would be young people, kids, that would be hurt first, that would be shot by rubber bullets, that would be sent to one police plaza. And so we knew that we had to get a message out that night, but it was very difficult. That was when I came back the next day with a friend of mine, Nyla Dari, and my sister, Nia White, who was 17 at the time, didn't even graduate high school yet. And we organized the first protest for Freedom March NYC, and that's literally the name of it, Freedom March NYC. It was on May 31st, 2020. It was on the 99th anniversary of the burning of Black Wall Street. And we posted the flyer at 12 p.m. on Instagram, and by 8 p.m. had our organized one of the largest demonstrations to take place in New York City that evening. And can I stop you there because, so for the majority of us who have never organized a mass action of civil disobedience, um, like literally what do you do? Um, you know, what is the step from the realizations you're describing to what we all witnessed and participated in? Like try to make that um, tangible and relatable to somebody who's like, I would do that, but I don't even know where to begin. You have to have the stomach for it, I'll tell you that. Mm. Um, 
But I would say that you have to know your community. You have to know who is going to stand with you. You have to know what you want to say. And you have to create something around that, right? We've organized sit-ins. We've taken over bridges. We have done things that, honestly, a video camera should never even be there for, right? Because the part of disruption that a lot of people don't understand is that social media can't encompass it. Social media is a tool, it's not the tool. And so when we posted a lot of our actions on social media, that was to get everyone to come to a specific location, right? Um, I also want to use this opportunity to pay tribute to so many of the organizers of 2020 because Freedom March NYC could not have done it alone, and that's why I said you need your community. We had sister organizing groups, we had the bikers who would make sure that they stood in front of cars as they were coming. One of the bikers were actually killed in 2020 as a result of one of the protests that happened. Everyone within our community, we knew. And because of that, you become responsible, right? And I think that accountability is also so important in organizing and that realization that, of course, it's a centralized movement, but in a lot of ways, it's supposed to be decentralized by design because if anyone's ever heard of COINTELPRO, then there's no surprise as to why we structured 2020 the way that we did. I, ironically, because so many people had rushed to help in Minneapolis, that left um, what I've heard you describe as a vacuum in other mm -hmm. cities like New York, and you noticed that. Describe what that looked like and what you mean by that. Yeah, so there was a vacuum, right, in New York City because so many people were going to Minneapolis to stand in solidarity with the George Floyd family, and as a result of that, Minneapolis, right, became kind of ground zero. But at the same time, there were so many protests breaking out across the country, and so who were the organizers that were doing that? And so we had a lot of, of friends and just folks and comrades who were organizers, right, and so for us, we said, okay, how can we support? And we did not know that an organizer, because the plan was to hold down the fort in New York City until they came back. <laughs> but we had no idea the way that the movement would respond to Freedom March NYC. And it was so much bigger than us. And I think that the reason for that was because it was so unbelievable to see young black women take up space in the way that we did. Mm. And that inspired so many other black women organizers that came out of 2020. I have a friend who may be here today, her name is Kim, and she um, started an organizing group and she said that she remembers walking out to one of the protests one day and just hearing like some young black woman on the megaphone. She was like, who the heck is that? You know. <laughs> and after that she was like, okay, if they can do it, then I can do it. Yes. And if you know Kimberly Bernard, she is one of the most prolific and most incredible organizers that have come out of 2020 in New York City. So I, I embedded in that, I was gonna ask you, like, what were your expectations at the time? Like, did you say, you know, if we can do X, Y, and Z, this will be worthwhile? Um, it sounds like it was like, we just wanna hold down the fort. Um, but yeah. beyond that, I mean, what were you, on the front end, what were you expecting or thinking? So it became, we wanted to hold down the fort too. We saw the ways in which historically this has always happened, that black women were being intentionally pushed out of conversations and pushed to the margins of the movements. And so initially it was, we're gonna hold down the fort, but then it was like, actually no, we're gonna stay here. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna stay here because what's not gonna happen is what happened in the 60s. What's not mm. gonna happen is what's historically happened where black women have built and carried movements and when it's time for people to come and say, who did it? They were sent to the kitchen. No, no, we're not gonna do that. And so what we did was that we created a safe place for other black women organizers to also be seen, to be resourced, and to be given a platform to do so much incredible work because the truth is that a lot of the organizations, of course, incredible, the work that they've done, but there's an intersectionality piece that always has to be talked about. When we showed up, we didn't just show up for black men, we showed up for black women, we showed up for black trans women who are oftentimes left at the margins of conversations. And so it was so important for us to say, if we are going to do this, we are gonna do this in the way that is reflective of our generation. At, at, yeah. At what point did you decide, okay, well, we're just gonna be in the streets nonstop, and why was that particular idea important? 
So I don't believe that you necessarily create movements. I think that you respond to it. And at the time, people were calling on us, right? So we actually led the George Floyd Memorial on, I think it was the first week of June from Cadman Plaza all the way into the city. It was close Cadman to 10. Cadman Plaza in Brooklyn. Which in is, Brooklyn, So that yeah. means you gotta cross a bridge, cross a bridge. you gotta cross a river. It's a long way for folks it's, it's, who aren't from New York. Very, and it was so hot. It was so hot. <laughs> and I think it was about 10 to 20,000 people that we led across that bridge. Um, and then, we just continued to be outside, right? Because even though we had the memorial and all these things that were happening, we knew that if we went back inside, then that would also signal to the rest of the world that it was okay to go back inside. Mm. And there was nothing normal about experiencing two pandemics. There was nothing normal about seeing the way in which our country responded to COVID-19 in such a way that shut down systems. But when we were talking about 400 years of slavery to reckon with, why is it taking so long to shut down systems? And so that is why we stayed outside and we were in Minneapolis, right? When everything was happening, we were there when Chauvin was convicted. We organized marches in Minnesota with high schoolers that did an, uh, a walkout. Um, and then we were asked to speak at the March on Washington in 2020. And that was when it really kicked off the work in a national way because people saw what was being stirred up in New York and other young people were paying attention to that. We got just about 30 seconds before we have to take a break, but I have to ask you, having heard all of that, how did you care for yourself in the middle of all this? Barely. I mean, I think that the reality is that it was exhausting, it was draining, and for so many of us who were there in 2020, we are still recovering from what it meant to give so much to the movement. Mm. We need to take a break. This is a special edition of Notes from America. We're celebrating Martin Luther King Day at the historic Apollo Theater in Harlem, New York. I'm Kai Wright. I'm talking with Chelsea Miller, co-founder of the youth-led civil rights organization, Freedom March NYC. When we come back, National Book Award winning scholar of African American Studies, Amani Perry, will join us again. Stay with us. My name is Billy Mitchell. I'm the tour director at the world famous Apollo Theater. I'm the in-house historian. I'm the Apollo ambassador. I've been giving service, uh, rather than saying working at the Apollo, but I've been giving service to the Apollo Theater since 1965. The Apollo Theater to Harlem, it's, it's that beacon. It's that, that cultural light, that, that energy, that, and that pride that this community feels because of this building. You know, back in the 60s, during the civil rights movement, uh, artists, the lyrical content started talking about, you know, uh, what was happening in civil rights. And uh, artists would perform that on the stage of the Apollo Theater. And so it got into the conscious of a lot of people that would come here to see shows. So you talk about James Brown saying, uh, yeah, say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. Uh, you know, Curtis Mayfield, we are the people. You know, Marvin Gaye, what's going on? So these, these messages of, of hope and, and activism were expressed in lyrics and in performances on the stage of the Apollo Theater. I don't recall Dr. King ever coming inside the theater. However, in 1958, across the street from the Apollo Theater, Bloomstein's department store, uh, Dr. King was stabbed by a deranged lady in his chest. But what happened was when he was stabbed, they couldn't pull the knife out. The police wouldn't let, because people were saying, pull it out, pull it out. The, he, the police says, no, you leave it out. Uh, don't pull it out. So they took Dr. King to the then Harlem Hospital, 
and they worked on him and they said had they pulled the knife out, he would have bled internally and he would have died instantly. So Harlem saved Dr. King that day. Welcome back. I'm Kai Wright, and this is a special Martin Luther King Jr. Day broadcast of Notes from America, live on stage at the world-famous Apollo Theater in Harlem, New York. It is a really fitting place for us to gather in conversation about racial justice movements, both past and present. I'm talking with Chelsea Miller, co-founder of the youth-led civil rights organization Freedom March NYC, and we are now rejoined by Amani Perry, Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University. Amani, welcome back. Thanks. So, Amani, as a student of all these movements, uh, mm. past and present, where do you see continuity between today's movements uh, and the civil rights generation, and where do you see them depart from one another? Uh, I mean, I think you know the continuity is found. I, I love the example that Chelsea gave of, of the impact of her mother that we actually, that we inherit legacies, right? And whether or not we're talking about organizers, we inherit a sense of civic and social responsibility and that that fuels the, the, the work of subsequent generations. Um, and so I let, you know, for me, tradition is really important and I think we see that present. Um, I also think, but, but, the, but some of the distinction really is also resonant with something um, that Chelsea said, which is, a refusal to be um, so concerned with uh, respectability or conventional ideas about who should be at the front of leadership, who sh what, what the face of, in particular, mm -hmm. black America should be, um, a refusal to succumb to that so that all members of the community can be not just served but recognized as relevant for the cause of liberation. That is something that this generation has pushed forward in a way that I think should be an inspiration for all of us and that I hope that we carry forward into the future. Indeed. What about you, Chelsea? I, I know that you have thought often about previous generations of activists. You talked about it some already. Um, what do you take from the civil rights movement and where do you think today's movements need to depart from it? Shirley Chisholm, Fannie Lou Hamer, Ida B. Wells, Lorraine Hansberry, yes. Nina Simone, Billie Holiday, ooh, black woman. So in response to that, I would say stories that need to be told trauma that needs to be unpacked, legacies that need to be built, and testimonies that need to be written. And so when I see the civil rights movement, first of all, the civil rights movement wasn't the first movement for racial justice that existed in America. We love talking about it, Indeed. and I'll talk about it forever, but let's be honest, it's been a 400-year fight. So the reality is that when we talk about the institution of slavery and the ways in which black women have carried the family units, when you talk about the ways in which black women experience trauma and slavery, we have stories to tell. Mm -hmm. And so I think that for this generation, I see that we are, to the point that you made, reimagining everything all together. It's very clear that a lot of the narratives that we've received have been spoon-fed, right? I remember when I learned about Martin Luther King, it was always juxtaposed to Malcolm X. I don't know why. It's different strategies ultimately trying to achieve the same goal. And so I think for us, we've learned from history, we have recognized our power, and we've also said that we can do this as a leaderless movement because the truth is all of us have stories that need to be told. And I think that is where our power as our generation has come from. Mm. I also wonder, Amani, about this, the leaders list. One of the things we often hear is like, the, the, the past movements were so leader driven, future movements <laughs> are, are leaderless. Is that a true divide? I mean, that when, when, I, when I think about previous movements, they were, they, were, they were quite community driven as well, right? I mean, help me with this. Absolutely, I mean, I think that this is, well, I think the distinction is really between organizing and moments of mobilization. So you hear, I mean, one of the things that I think is uh, 
is consistent when movements have been effective is that they come out of the organizing tradition, which means that one has to recognize that all of the participants are relevant, right? The people who are actually were running the mimeograph machine, the people who were cooking the food for the movement, the people who actually held safe spaces for those who were on the front lines. I think that part of what has happened, though, the transition is that there is an explicit acknowledgment that all, so it's not just mm -hmm. that this is what was required to organize, but actually that we're going to make clear that these, all of these participants, it. yeah, we're gonna name it. And also we're gonna resist the desire, and this is actually, a lot of this is external, the desire to appoint individual leaders. And we have seen the negative consequences, right, of making, of naming movements as though they are uh, uh, solely a function of leaders, individuals, and, and and cannot continue without them. Assassination right? is amongst the consequences. Assassination and also co-optation, particularly mm -hmm. now. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. People get bought, right? And you, so movement has to be able to sustain itself even if someone winds up being seduced by the glitter and glamour, right? Um, and so that, I mean, so, so it's, not, it's not as though there's something, this is wholly new, but actually a kind of sophistication about mm -hmm. how we talk about what it is that we're doing. Mm -hmm. A lot has happened in the nearly three years since May of 2020. Um, and to some of us, Chelsea, the promise and revolutionary energy of that spring and summer feel distant, depressingly. Um, and I just wonder how you feel about where we're at politically. Um, as someone who is, one, was so involved, and two, who has such a sophisticated understanding of it, what would you say to us, those of us who feel like, wow, that, what happened to that moment? Mm. The civil rights movement existed for over a decade. If we are using 2020 to mark a period, then we are far from the end of where we're going. I think that we have to be realistic with what happened in 2020. It was a movement that sustained itself for over a year. I know organizers that were on the streets up until the elections and beyond. And so I think that when a lot of people say that the energy has waned, I think that the energy has went into hibernation. I think that the energy is recovering. I think that the energy is finding joy. I think that we are redefining for ourselves what does change look like, not as it's connected to systems, but as it's connected to how we rebuild and sustain our communities. And I think that if you're looking to see where the energy went, then you have to see where people are going. Mm. And I see a lot of people creating change locally. I see a lot of organizers who are now running for office. Mm. I see a lot of organizers who are using abolitionist frameworks to reimagine all sorts of systems. And I am energized by it. And I think that we are at a pendulum point within our country where the next couple of years will ultimately define what the next 10 to 15 years look like. And so we are just in the beginning. Mm. And that's exciting. Okay, okay. And I, and, you know, to be clear, I'm thinking less about the organizer's energy and more about sort of just the, the political conversation in the country, you know. Um, and, you know, and Amani, what do you, I mean, you, you, for, uh, this is a good point that Chelsea's making about, like, the civil rights movement was not a year long. Um, it was not two years long. The, the fight for racial justice indeed predates the existence of the United States. Um, what lesson would you take from history as to where we're at right now in the political conversation? Mm. I mean, I think that the, honestly, one of the, there's a couple of them. A primary lesson is that movements can't be held hostage to um, electoral cycles. And so there's a way there's that. that, you know, the, the that <laughs> election seasons can suck a lot of the energy out of the room. Um, and we have to resist that, that, uh, that uh, prospect. Um, I also think, you know, racism is in style right now, <laughs> in a big way it is, and white supremacy has a very active imagination, which means that organizers have to actually constantly be in the work of reconstituting what they're doing and gaining knowledge about how to struggle against it. So I think this is just a wonderful point that um, even when we, it's not all visible, right, the work still continues because the work on the other side is very, very active, right? And so 
I mean, I think, I guess to me, that's the lesson, right? And for those of us who are older, we have to be very careful. Sorry, I keep swinging around. We have to be very careful um, about not saying, well, we don't see anything right now, so you guys have lost energy. Mm. You know, they're, no, they're doing, the, the work doesn't happen that way, right? The work actually requires quiet time, reflective time, healing time, right? Um, and we know that historically, too, right? There are years that are the big years, right? A lot happens between those, those big years. I, I alluded to this a second ago, but I mean, Dr. King, as we, you know, we like to talk about Dr. Mm -hmm. King, we're here to talk about Dr. King. He was not a popular man in the United States during his lifetime. Uh, he was, in fact, assassinated. Yes. Um, that is a thing we tend to forget in these memorials. Um, and, you know, people and movements pushing for change just have never really been embraced in real time. I mean, is that a fair statement, you think, looking at history of money, that it's, that it, it's not popular to be Chelsea? Well, embraced by who, mm. right? Because it depends, because I think that's also a question of the audience, right? The peep, I mean, you know, what mat you know, you know, what matters is who you're working for, right? The people matter, right? Um, so I would say yes, and the people know if you love them or not, right? What do you think, Chelsea? I mean, it's because also I'm thinking about when I asked you earlier about how you care for yourself how you sustain yourself in this work. Um, how do you think about um, the way the work is received? Um, is it what Amani's saying, or is there something more to it? I think that even the way that it's perceived is a strategy, right? Mm -hmm. um, you go on my social media, the social media isn't the work. The work is the work. And so I think that it's really important for us to understand that it's not necessarily about popularity, it's about what you can achieve with the tools that you have. Um, a lot of times, you know, we use various platforms to get a message across or we use um, comrades to disseminate information. And so I would say that if it's popular or not, the work still has to get done. And I think that we are shifting our generation and I think you'd be surprised to see how popular it is nowadays to really think about how we want to disrupt the world. I think related to this, you made a, a remark earlier about defining your own liberation. Mm -hmm. um, say more about that. What do you mean by that? I think that we are used to the narratives of the martyrs because that was the tactic that was used to silence us. And I don't think that black liberation has to be tied to trauma. I think that it should be tied to joy. I think that our love, I think that our history, which to your point, Kai, exists way beyond when we got to these shores of America, I think that it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That's why I spend a lot of time traveling to Ghana. I actually flew from Ghana to come to this event today because it's a responsibility to connect the conversations of blackness in the diaspora and understand that we are our own liberation, not defined by whiteness or white supremacy, but defined by our ancestors. Chelsea Miller is co-founder of the youth-led civil rights organization Freedom March NYC. Amani Perry is professor of African American Studies at Princeton University. Thank you both so much for this time. I'm Kai Wright. This has been a special broadcast of Notes from America celebrating Martin Luther King Jr. Day and recorded live on stage at the Apollo Theater in Harlem, New York. We leave you with one more song from The Collective. This is a wonderful group of performers from Washington, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. They're led by the director, Jonathan Bell, of The Dream Launchers, and they are going to sing their own arrangement of Lift Every Voice and Sing. Thank you for celebrating with us. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven Let us.
more thing, because I made a mistake, we gotta track the credits. So um, bear with me and enjoy the credits to the show. Notes from, a Notes from America is a production of WNYC Studios. Find us on Instagram at Notes with Kai. And remember, you can always find each full show on WNYC's YouTube page. This week's special show surely took a village to make. A special thanks to our friends at the Apollo Theater and to New York Public Radio's diversity, equity, and inclusion team and to WNYC's archives for that MLK recording. And another big thank you to the March on Washington Film Festival for helping sponsor the show. Lots of engineering work went into this show, mixing and music by Jared Paul, as always. Ed Haber and George Wellington recorded us on stage. Matthew Mirando ran the boards for the live radio show. Eric Weber handled all the cool video production that you can check out on our YouTube page. And then there is our regular team of editors, producers, and reporters, Karen Froman, Vanessa Handy, Regina Dehir, Rahima Nasa, Kusha Navadar, and Lindsay Foster Thomas. And I'm Kai Wright. Thanks for hanging out. How about another ad for the collective? Produced by Jonathan Ball, presented by the Grim Archers. Up next, we'll continue with the musical proportion portion of our presentation. When Dr. King needed music for his rallies to raise money, he called his friends, Harry Belafonte, Mahalia Jackson, Joan Baez, Bob Dylan. He called his friends. When we needed music to celebrate Dr. King today, we called our friends. Dream Launchers, Damian Sneed, Nicole Pfeiffer, Chauncey Packer, and the Harlem Chamber Players, Arwan Ortiz, Lester St. Louis. Thank you for being here with us as we celebrate our brother, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We continue now with In Memoriam to all the fallen civil rights heroes, heroes, activists lost over the last two years. They'll be read by WNYC's Brian Lehrer. They'll be accompanied by the Harlem Chamber Players. I'm Brian Lehrer, host of The Brian Lehrer Show on WNYC. Today's celebration of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. marks the first time that we are back at the Apollo Theater for this since 2020. And though I am not physically with you today, I am definitely here in spirit and now in memoriam for the many civil rights activists we have lost in the last two years. Clifford L. Alexander, the first black secretary of the Army and chairman of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. The Reverend Calvin O. Butts III, dynamic Harlem pastor who led the Abyssinian Baptist Church. Reverend W. Sterling Carey, the first black leader of the National Council of Churches. Doris Derby, an educator, artist, activist, and civil rights era photographer. Rabbi Israel Dresner, civil rights champion and king ally following the Jewish doctrine of Tukun Olam to repair the world. Authorine Lucy Foster, 
first black student at the University of Alabama. Lonnie Guineer, legal scholar on voting rights and affirmative action, nominated Assistant Attorney General by President Clinton. Alcee Hastings, longtime Florida congressman known as a strong liberal voice. Vernon Jordan, civil rights leader and DC power broker who counseled presidents and business leaders. Sam Ella Lewis, black artist and art historian who founded a museum dedicated to promoting black arts. Valerie Maynard, sculptor and printmaker aligned with the black arts movement, tackling racism and oppression while reflecting on African-American culture. Bob Moses, crusader for civil rights who registered thousands of voters and trained a generation of activists in Mississippi in the early 1960s. Nichelle Nichols, Lieutenant Uhura on Star Trek, who later worked with NASA to recruit people of color for the space program. Colin Powell, former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Secretary of State, and National Security Advisor. Gloria Richardson, civil rights advocate, whose efforts to refocus the movement on economic justice made her a bridge between more moderate leaders and black power activism. Bill Russell, trailblazing basketball champion who marched with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and spoke out against segregation in Boston public schools. Charles Sherrod, civil rights pioneer in rural Georgia who brought his deep Christian faith and commitment to grassroots organizing to Albany, Georgia. Mary Alice Thatch, crusading third-generation newspaper publisher in North Carolina who led the fight to exonerate 10 civil rights activists wrongly convicted of arson in the 1970s. Lucille Times, inspiration for the Montgomery bus boycott who stopped riding the city's segregated buses six months before Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat. Franklin A. Thomas, groundbreaking Ford Foundation president, the first black person to run a major American philanthropy. He revitalized it, shifting its focus to poverty and education. To those mentioned and the countless others who contributed to the ongoing struggle for civil rights, we honor you. In keeping with African tradition, Ashe.
Dr. David Baker dedicated to Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. This is MLK Blueprint for the Culture. Next, we welcome Dr. King's favorite song. He requested this song time and time again. It was one of the early gospel hits written by a young man named Thomas Dorsey. Shortly after moving to Chicago, the father of gospel music, he embraced Mahalia Jackson, who made this song famous. It was sung at Dr. King's funeral. It was sung at the March on Washington. It was sung at rallies to raise money to get protesters out of jail. It was written when Dorsey's child was lost in childbirth. And he said these words, take my hand, precious Lord. Please welcome the multi-genre recording artist, instrumentalist, the last accompanist for Miss Aretha Franklin, pianist Damian Sneed, and vocalist Nicole Pfeiffer, performing Thomas Dorsey's Precious Lord, Take My Hand.
Dr. King was a pastor and a preacher. And he gave a sermon called The Drum Major's Instinct. This is the dream that wasn't meant to be ours by Arwan Ortiz featuring Lester St. Louis on cello. We all have the drum major instinct. This is the dominant impulse. This quest for recognition. This desire for attention. This drum major instinct and somehow this warm glow we feel when we are praised when our name is in print is something of a vitamin A to our ego. Nobody is unhappy when they are praised. Even if they know they don't deserve it. even if they don't believe it. But everybody likes to be praised because of this real drum major instinct. Everybody can be great because anybody can serve. have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. grace and a soul generated by love.
towards towards the end of Dr. King's service. His literary muse, Langston Hughes, wrote a poem, an ode to Dr. King. These men inspired one another. They traveled to Africa together. I'll take this piece with me to celebrate Langston Hughes on his birthday at Lincoln Center on February 1st. We give it to you now. This is demonstration. Did you ever walk into a fire hose with the water turned up full blast? Did you ever walk towards police guns, knowing that each step might be your last? Did you ever stand in the face of snarling dogs and not move as the dogs came? Did you ever feel tear gas burn your day, your night, your dawn, your dawn when the world is a rainbow hue, your dawn when the guns are no longer aimed at you, your dawn when the cops forget their jails. Your dawn when police dogs wag their tails. Your dawn when the tear gas canisters are dry. Your dawn when you own that star in the sky. Your dawn when the atom bomb is yours. Your dawn, when you own the keys to all the doors. Your dawn, will you ever forget your dawn? One more time for Langston Hughes and Dr. King, the Harlem School of the Arts dancers joining us for that piece. We trust that you've enjoyed MLK, the blueprint for the culture. It's our celebration of Dr. King. This has been a presentation of WNYC, the Apollo Theater, in partnership with the March on Washington Film Festival. And we're gonna close with our finale performed by a group that serves as a social impact initiative and source of global entertainment, Apollo Theater. These young folks were performing earlier at Red Rooster. We're just about set.
please put your hands and hearts together for Sing Harlem Choir. Somebody say, Sing Harlem. Let me hear you say, sing, oh, sing, oh, okay. We're going to celebrate. Singing this song. So I want everybody to stand 